The whole thing was, and had to be, a game of bluff, from start to finish. It was not what you'd call a proper military feat of arms, but just a minor episode in the course of the greater campaign. Just before the war began, I had telegraphed to headquarters at the Cape to say that we must have some good artillery if we were to hold the place. The answer came, in cold language, that two 4.7 guns were being sent up by the next train. This glad news was published and no doubt went to the Boers also, and the garrison flocked down to the station to meet the two monster guns that were going to make our attackers sit up. When the train rolled in, there was no outward sign of these guns. I asked the guard, where are our guns that you're going to brought up? Oh, yes, sir, I've got them in my van. And there they were, two little nine-pounder guns, and old ones at that. One of the men who'd served with me in Matabililand three years previously recognized them. Why, he said, blowed if that isn't old crooked-tailed Sal, a gun we had used in Rhodesia with a badly damaged trail. In telling me to expect the big guns, the wrong code word had been used, and instead of nine-pounder, they had used the word for 4.7, a very different pair of shoes. But the report had got out that we had the big guns. You see, up to the actual outbreak of war, we had lots of spies in the place, and we gave them something to report. For instance, we laid explosive mines all round the place. They were contained in small boxes and were made up by an expert in a certain building and were then carried with the greatest care by natives who were warned against the disastrous explosion that would follow if they should drop one of them. These boxes were carefully buried at different points round the front of the town and wires were laid connecting them with the central observation post. Notices were posted in English and Dutch warning the inhabitants that if they allowed their cattle or children to wander there, it would be at their own risk. We gave notice that on a certain day, trial would be made with one or more of the mines to see that they were in working order. So people were warned to keep clear of the east front between 12 and 2. Between 12 and 2, with everybody safe indoors, Major Panzera and I crept out and stuck a stick of dynamite into an old Aunt Bear hole. We lit the fuse, ran like fun, and took cover until the thing went off, which it did with a splendid roar and a vast cloud of dust. Out of the dust emerged a man with a bike who happened to be passing and he peddled off as hard as he could go for the Transvaal, about eight miles away, where, no doubt, he told how, by merely riding along the road, he had hit off a murderous mine. I may explain that the only dynamite we had was the one stick of it that we had used for our experiment, and the boxes were actually filled with nothing more dangerous than sand. One thing that put mafficking over much in the limelight at home during the early days of the siege was that we sent out exuberantly cheerful messages to Lord Roberts, our Commander-in-Chief. He was anxious to know how we were getting on and to show him that all was well, we sent such messages. But it was also done for another reason. The messages were carried by native runners who had to creep through the Boer lines at night. And in the event of their being captured, our messages were read by the enemy. And so these would not be at all encouraging to them. We never thought that the messages would then be sent on to England. As it was, they arrived there just at a time when our forces in other parts of South Africa were suffering some nasty setbacks at the hands of the Boers. So anything that relieved the gloom set up by these 
was welcomed at home just then with exaggerated joy. We had around Mavicking at first some 10 to 12,000 Boers under General Kranji, and another strong force was engaged up north against Plumer's column at Tule. So in order to get more of them, if possible, busy up here and away from the southern ports, I wrote a letter to an Englishman who had settled within the Transvaal border north of Mafeking. I knew, as a matter of fact, he had died and that, therefore, the letter would be opened by the post office people. So I wrote as if from some friend of his, telling him that a secret British force was going to make a raid into the Transvaal, passing close by his farm. But this was a dead secret, and he must not tell a soul about it. Consequence was, a column of some 1,200 Boers went to the place and stayed there a long time waiting for this secret force. I met their commandant a year or two later and heard all about it from him. In the middle of his yarn, he looked at me suspiciously and suddenly asked, did you write that letter? And when I modestly admitted that I had, he shook hands and congratulated me on being a very successful, well, bluffer. We beat off a good number of attacks in daylight, but I was always afraid they might get us with a night attack, as they easily could have done. To discourage this, we started searchlights. Again, a bluff. We only had one, and that was a tin cowl made out of a biscuit tin with a strong acetylene lamp inside it. This was mounted on the top of a pole, the foot of which stood on the ground, so it was held upright by one man who could then turn it round and send its ray round the front. We only had a very small supply of acetylene and just this one lamp, but that one lamp did yeoman duty. No sooner had it done a display in one fort than it was rushed off to a different one and showed a few flashes there. Next night, it blazed up in quite another part of the defences. And thus, we spread an impression that any night attack would be exposed to a perfect blaze of searchlights everywhere. Crooked Tail's cell, as well as our other elderly guns, was not much use to us. And so we manufactured gun for ourselves. We took the steam pipe of an engine, and this was reinforced with some iron railings, melted down and shrunk onto it. A brass trunnion and breech were cast and shrunk on, and the whole contraption was mounted on the wheels of an old thrashing machine. My name among the natives was Impisa, the wolf, meaning the beast that doesn't sleep at night. So this gun was christened the wolf, because it was chiefly to be used at night. You see, with homemade powder and shot, the wolf did not carry so very far. So in order to make up for this, we used to move it out in the night as silently as we could, with its wheels wrapped up in canvas and straw, till we got within range of the enemy's camp. Then we hung up blankets all round it so that the flash would not be very visible. Then we loosed off our shots as fast as we could and then lay low while the enemy spent the rest of the night firing vaguely at where they thought we were which was generally where we were not. 